Hi friends. So I was reading the other day that Paul Manafort admitted to selling election data to a Russian asset. If the FBI had any credibility, we would have all known that about four years ago, but what you're gonna do? You remember Paul Manafort, right? He helped that rich pro-Russian anti-NATO guy become president despite not winning all the popular vote? And now the whole world seems focused on the aftermath of their disastrous administration? No, 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 not that guy. This guy over here. In 2010, he helped Viktor Yanukovych get elected president of Ukraine with 48% of the popular vote on the promise that he would keep Ukraine strong, independent, and never allow Russia to treat Ukraine as a little brother. However, as soon as he was elected, Yanukovych began pursuing closer ties with Russia. He extended their lease of the port of Sevastopol until 2042. He appointed Russians to important positions in the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Security Service. In a TV broadcast, Yanukovych proclaimed that the Great Famine of 1932 and 33 was not the fault of the Soviets, a declaration made by the previous government. He signed several trade agreements which allowed Russia to control part of Ukraine's natural gas pipelines. And in 2011, he began jailing pro-Western politicians, starting with the former prime minister and Yanukovych's outspoken presidential opponent, Yulia Tomoshenko, on charges of abuse of power and embezzlement. Despite all this, in November of 2013, after a 16-year wait, Ukraine was finally invited to be an associate member of the EU, a popular move that would have reduced Ukraine's dependency on Russia and made trading with their neighbors to the west much cheaper. Unfortunately, just days before the treaty was to be signed, Yanukovych pulled out of the deal. Protests immediately broke out across the country, the largest one at Independence Square in Kyiv. Starting on November 21st, about 1,500 people took part in a peaceful protest against the government in the capital city, with more joining by the day. By the 30th, several thousand protesters showed up, but in Ukraine, there was no freedom of protest, so government sent out their jackbooted thugs to end the demonstration. The protesters were violently and publicly dispersed by riot police. The next day, Thousands more activists came back to the square and stayed for almost 12 weeks. In the months to follow, Maidan saw nightly clashes with the authorities and so many injuries that multiple makeshift hospitals opened up in buildings adjacent to the square. But in spite of the government's heavy-handed tactics, the crowd continued to grow. More than half a million Ukrainians eventually showed up. Men, women, young, old, rich, poor, they all gathered to protest the government's pro-Russia policies. Originally organized under the hashtag Euromaidan, the protests evolved into a revolution intent on forcing the government to pursue a closer relationship with the EU. Even the politicians began clashing in Parliament. 
the pro-Russia clique thought that allowing people to speak against the government could destabilize the country and lead to lawlessness and riots, while the pro-West clique wanted to allow people the freedom to protest and to speak their mind. The pro-Russia clique had control of parliament, so government forces continued the assault on a daily basis. But protesters were not going home. The government's efforts to beat them into submission only resulted in the pro-Western crowd getting larger and more determined. Eventually, the protesters started building huge walls of fire separating themselves from the police. On January 16th, a series of anti-protest laws passed, and although there was reports of police shooting into the crowd before, these new laws seemed to embolden the police to shoot at protesters much more frequently. On January 19th, the riot police tried again to clear Maidan, and when the people began to fight back, the police snipers opened fire, killing nine. The revolutionaries, driven by a thirst for freedom, wouldn't budge, but they did start using new tactics. Women and the elderly would stay in the middle of the square, while artisans began constructing metal shields and body armor for the brave warriors on the front lines. Self-defense teams would build barricades and hold off the police. Once the shooting started, their job was to draw fire until women and the elderly could escape to safety, either in a building or on the other side of the square. Scenes of revolutionaries with makeshift shields being shot by police snipers enraged the public, caused police not to show up for work and others to switch sides, making each protest more chaotic than the last. Guys, why are you down here? It's actually very simple. We are fighting for our freedom, that's all. The battle for the future of Ukraine roared from street to street. The revolution came to a head on February 20th, when thousands of protesters marched towards Parliament with shields and helmets. Police snipers opened fire. It was a massacre. At least a hundred were killed, and more injured than anyone could count. This was the last straw. After months of unrest and violence, and several hundred dead Ukrainians, some of Yanukovych's closest supporters in parliament turned against him. In the early hours of February 22nd, Yanukovych, along with a number of high-ranking government officials, fled to Russia. Later that day, while protesters stood guard outside the building, Ukrainian parliament removed Viktor Yanukovych from the post of President of Ukraine with a vote of 328 to 0. At about the same time, just to the north of Kyiv, Ukrainians began exploring Yanukovych's lavish and, at this point, abandoned mansion. They found the lifelong public servant had been living in a 340-acre estate complete with a zoo, tennis courts, several ponds with fountains, and they found something in a place they didn't expect. Thousands of Yanukovych's documents floating in the Kievsky Reservoir. Over 9,000 documents were eventually recovered, 
providing evidence that Yanukovych was not only embezzling and laundering money for decades, but he was also having journalists and activists intimidated and beaten just a few days before he fled to Russia. His house was kept intact and is now a park and the world's only museum of corruption. The revolution of dignity was over. The people had won. But the fight for independence from Russia was just beginning. The government was shattered and disorganized. Entire regions had no one to oversee or coordinate public programs like police, mail, and fire department. Few people in local government even knew who was in charge. It took four days to form a new government in Kyiv. Within five days, Putin had used the confusion to incite separatist rebellions in eastern Ukraine and annexed Crimea with his little green men. Within a week, tens of thousands of brave men who had just fought and defeated a corrupt government joined the Ukrainian armed forces to fight the Russian aggressors, now encroaching on their land. This was the start of a conflict which continues to this day and has claimed the lives of over 10,000 civilians. But that's a story for another video. Hey friends, thanks for spending some time with me today. Don't forget to hit one of the thumb buttons and uh, subscribe if you want to hear more from me. And don't you ever forget, the Falklands belongs to Argentina. Those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable.